But I think the beauty of memoir is that connection to someone who is struggling and trying to figure out the struggling. Today's guest is Ira Sukruguran, whose latest book, This Jade World, is hot off the presses. It, it was written in Thailand. I have an annual visit to Thailand to visit family. This was the first visit after the divorce. And so every morning I sat on my mother's porch and I wrote, and it was really kind of writing just for me, it was writing not to think about it as a book at all, mm -hmm. um, but to get things out that I had locked away. And so the book is really about divorce. It's about wanting. Um, I married young and I married an older poet. And I found out that a lot of the things that I wanted were the things that she wanted because she had shaped in many ways my ideas, my being in the world. And so when we broke up, the question was, what is it? You know, what is it I want? What is it mm -hmm. that I, I really desire? You year after the divorce was a kind of a year of like trying to find myself to try things I'd never tried before to do things, you know, some, some things really terrible. And this would be one of the harder times of my life, but I think out of it came my greatest joy, right? Because one of the things I wanted was, you know, to be a father which yeah. is something, you know, one of the things that we uh, disagreed on in the marriage. It was an a, a amicable breakup. It was just really about wanting, about we wanted separate things over the years. You know, after it happened, I was able to really reconfigure and rethink my life and really think about, okay, fatherhood is still possible. Some of the hardest things in our lives are always coupled with some of their, our greatest joys. There's not a semester that I don't teach one of your essays. When I read your work and when students read your work, we feel close to you. Do you have a sense of like, I guess I want your secret, Ira. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you manage that? Oh, man. So one of the things that I love about memoir writing and um, one of the things I love reading um, in memoir is this issue of vulnerability, talking about the things that we're afraid to talk about, um, to right. go to the places that we um, don't go, or we don't even tell our best friends or parents, right? But we, we are trying to connect somehow um, with these readers. And so uh, sometimes you have to rip the bandage off right? You just mm -hmm. have to rip it off and show the wound for what it is and to look at it and to find ways of understanding that wound to get closer to the topic. And also maybe to get closer to readers is to not have as strong of a protective filter. We protect ourselves from vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because we don't want to feel uh, weak or seen as weak. It's not necessarily what you reveal, but there seems just to be an openness. There's a cringe quality to memoir writing, <laughs> right? Art of it though, the art of memoir is to go beyond the cringe, right? To go beyond the hardship, the trauma. That's the more important part that we're trying to figure out the suffering in a really kind of dark and sad way. We're, we're connected by <laughs> our various ways of suffering, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I could write forever about not having had a father, but it's more vulnerable for me to say, hey, after that faculty meeting, I ate a bunch of candy corn because I was so stressed about it. Sometimes it's not scale, but how close yeah. it is to you. The, the biggest difference that um, in my writing process of this book was that I always tell my students that you need to have some sort of emotional distance, some perspective mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the piece. With this book, I, I just went into it without the emotional distance. It was a, It was a very different process, but I think also it brought me closer to the material. It made me look at the material differently. The closeness that I'm talking about is, you know, vulnerability, but also beauty. And I've never been to Thailand, but I get a sense of it with your descriptions there. Again, there's just this closeness and lushness to the right without using a lot of elevated language, which I think is another thing that helps us be there with you. When I start getting overly lyrical or overly intellectual, Mm -hmm. that's my avoidance mechanism. That's my wanting not to go places where... That's your <laughs> candy corn, Ira. That's right. your candy <laughs> Exactly. That's the candy corn. Yeah. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And so start really understanding your process and your defense mechanism. I'm, I'm going to read, let me see here, uh, a short chapter, uh, and it's called After the Hysterectomy. After the Hysterectomy. When you meet someone at 21, someone nine years older and wiser, you learn the world through her eyes. You are a blank slate, a boy who hasn't lost enough. You adopt what she wants and her views on life, her interests, nature, birds, the infinite flat of Illinois become your interests. And suddenly you, the urban misfit, 
find yourself donning a pair of binoculars and aiming them in a tangle of branches, leaning your ear to every tweet and Twitter, any rapid flap of wings. And suddenly, you want to retire in an old farmhouse in central Illinois near her family and grow corn and strawberries, raising horses you will never ride. And suddenly, you begin to write poetry, love poetry, want to be a poet like she is, deep, dark, and mysterious, with a gift for composing perfect iambic lines. Because of her, you don't want children. Complain of their noise and ruckus on plains, the way they can't control the yarn of drool dripping from their toothless mouths. But then a sadness sets in, a sadness that feels like a hand to the throat. Because after all these years, you don't know what you want. You with the graying beard, you with the belly distending over the waistline of your jeans. This dawns on you as you sit in the waiting room of a hospital because your wife is having a hysterectomy. You think this is what you want too, because you can't bear the pain she suffers every month she menstruates, her headaches that fetal her in the center of the bed. You want this, but you don't understand why your right knee bounces with a ferocity that shakes the bench. You share with other people, people waiting for loved ones, people who stare at the crazy Asian man with an unstillable knee. You want this, but the finality of the decision has taken away a path in your life. And the Buddhist you are wonders whether that path would have led to nirvana. In that waiting room, you imagine a child, one you've created, one without a face, a child, your child, yours. And you hear that child's laughter, and you feel that child's breath. And you understand why your mother clings to you, why she squeezes your arms and legs even now as if she thinks you are not real, a dream she does not want to lose. In that waiting room, for perhaps the first time, you find yourself wanting. It fills you like a fragrant flood of, of a pond of lotuses, beautiful gaping blooms hungry with want, but you keep quiet. You do not voice this. What good would it do now? What good would it do when you are allowed to see your wife days from surgery slipping in and out of conscious and con slipping in and out of the conscious and unconscious world with her new body? What good would it do when you hold her hand, her voice weighed down with weariness, asking how the dogs are, asking whether you put the garbage out and gathered the mail? A couple of years later, you will remember that hospital room. You will remember the overcast light entering the curtain window and the gray that permeated that space. You will remember how your wife's long hair fanned the pillow, how even in post-surgical sleep, she was beautiful. You will remember the slight murmurs in her sleep, some mysterious conversation had in a dream. This would be the end, though you didn't know it then. The end. The end. And you will remember this. In that gray hospital room, your fingers feeding ice chips to her cracked lips, one cold chunk at a time, this last intimacy, this last act of love. That's so good. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to be quiet while you read. What I was trying to hold back was laughter and then a little bit of tears. Like I don't cry easily, but the thing is, it's like wise and funny, but also this sucker punch of emotion. And so... I think people are going to really connect with this on those on those levels. Thank you so much for for sharing that. Oh, that thank piece. you, thank you. you now, one of the things that about this book that was really interesting for me, and and the writing of this book comparatively to like my first book, is that mm -hmm. I I had to go and use different ways to enter the material, right? Mm -hmm. Like in this part, I use second person. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it in first person. Right. Mm -hmm. I needed that second person, you know, um, distance, mm -hmm. which is a really which is really funny because when I teach, I ask students like, what does the second person do for them? And they always say it brings us closer mm -hmm. to the material. And I thought, wow, that's funny, because for me, I use it to to further myself. <laughs> Escape from a little the bit. Material, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the power of the writing. Like, yeah, you've got that second person, which both calls and pushes. But um, it's the details. It's the baby's breath. It's putting your mother in there. It's all of the things that this one medical event that we don't tend to think about it contains for, for these two people and beyond. So I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. I would like to know if you have a writing prompt to share with viewers. Um, and hopefully it's going to be a writing prompt that makes us be able to do what you just <laughs> did. Some well, magic beans, Ira, please. I'll give you a, a little guilty pleasure. I rarely tell people. Okay. But I, I used to be and still am really addicted to um, like 
WWE wrestling. Right? <laughs> okay. um, and I'm not really addicted to the wrestling part. I like the show. I like mm -hmm. the, the microphone work that a lot of wrestlers do. My favorite, favorite, favorite wrestlers of all time. And now he's like incredibly famous is The Rock. What made him great is he always talked about himself in the third person. One of the hardest things for, for me sometimes when writing a new book is really kind of handling the I. I tell my students that the I is a very powerful pronoun. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a pronoun that owns your story. That I is very intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to, to let go. Um, sometimes that self-protective um, uh, thing kicks in, right? Mm -hmm. So you take a scene that's really difficult. It could be an argument with a significant other. It could be a past trauma, a secret, right? Mm -hmm. But not to do it in the first person, um, but to be able to do it in the third person, almost as if they're outside of their body. Kind of like, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge able to look at himself <laughs> and his past and that's and he finally realized what a what a heel he was right yeah um, really look at the little character details movement quirks um, to really look at the setting and world in that large wide angle way right yeah. because I think sometimes when we're in the eye we're so like the eye is so like this and we only see the situation we only right. see what's up close the really the magic of this is is if you wanted to go back to the eye the changing of the pv from he she they to i is so simple or the tricking the brain mm -hmm. right to mm -hmm. look at yourself as a character and not just the narrator this this mug here right it's not it's not <laughs> mine but it's one of those paint your own pottery mugs Cool. Right. This is actually my wife's, but I, there was a time period during, actually during, during the harder parts of the, um, the marriage, right. Before mm -hmm. the divorce where I obsessively went to a paint your own pottery studio, <laughs> like every single day. I was a regular, like they knew who I was. <laughs> and I sat there just painting endless things, you know, uh, mugs, plates. <laughs> I got so good. I got so good at it that People would come and ask me, you know, would you mind painting us like a set of these? Like this, <laughs> right? this mug right here was the mug my wife painted on one of our first dates. It's like a Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer mug. And it's so cute. It and it looks like it holds a good amount too. I don't like a small coffee mug. I want, I want a good amount, you know? No, absolutely. Uh, I'm at least a two or three cup a day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm three and I think that is going to make us live longer. I, I hope so. Yeah, oh, totally, <laughs> totally. We'll be talking in 50 years about another book. Check out the links below to order a copy of Ira's book and to learn more about his work. Also, be sure to hit subscribe so that you're notified of new author interviews. I look forward to seeing you next time at the Memoir Cafe.